It was May 1945, and Hitler's reign of terror had finally come crumbling down under the combined strength of the Allied powers. Victory for the Allies was guaranteed, and it was time to decide who would claim the spoils of war. For the Western powers, Berlin and the Prize Reich Chancellor were trophies that they could no longer claim, as the Soviets had beaten them to it as early as April. There was now only one other prestigious asset available for England, France, and America. The Kelstein House. The Reich Chancellor may have been the political headquarters of the Nazi regime, but the Kelstein House was Hitler's personal sanctuary and the site of a possible hideout for the last members of the Nazi administration. The Alpine Fort, built high in the Bavarian Alps above the quaint town of Berchtesgaden, also functioned as a luxury resort for Hitler and high members of the Nazi party during the Third Reich. As the remaining Allied superpowers raced against each other and within themselves to reach the prized location before anyone else, it would be a rebel group of soldiers who would ultimately claim the place and its surprising contents for themselves, even as they had been explicitly forbidden from doing so. More than a vacation home. Long before becoming a political figure, Adolf Hitler often vacationed in Berchtesgaden. He believed the place to be the quintessential representation of German culture, and as he became chancellor in 1933, Hitler bought a home in the area and started an extensive remodeling process. The transformation went far beyond the reach of a simple house, as the entire town had to be modified if the Fuhrer were to live there. Several construction ventures began to reshape Berchtesgaden with new offices, security and support services areas, and a post office. A new railway station with a luxurious reception was also built, especially for Hitler and his guests. In addition, the dictator had the Berchtesgaden Hof Hotel completely refashioned and it would eventually house famous visitors such as Neville Chamberlain and David Lloyd George. Hitler's complex consisted of the Berghof, or Mountain Court, his personal retreat. Then there was the Kelstein House, a diplomatic building erected on top of the summit of the Kelstein Mountain. And finally, the Tea House on the Moschlanerkopf Hill, a cylindrical relaxation building with a beautiful view of the neighboring mountain range, where Hitler would have lunch every day during his visits. Some historians claim that Hitler's retreat in the mountains was the only place where he would feel safe and have an ordinary life, so he vacationed there regularly. Due to the significant renovations made to the town and the importance Hitler himself gave to the area, the site became a haven for high-ranking Nazi leaders. As time progressed, many infamous Third Reich commanders built homes in the town, including Hermann Göring. As the war drew to a close and Germany's defeat became unavoidable, Joseph Goebbels employed what remained of his propaganda machine to promote the idea that a Nazi resistance movement would prevail after the war and that dissident German soldiers would conduct guerrilla warfare for many years to come. Allied strategists believed that the Berchtesgadener complex would be an ideal location from which to direct and maintain such furtive operations, and thus the Kelstein House and the town below it became a primary target as the European theater of World War II came to an end. By May of 1945, the Allied forces were finding low resistance as they rolled through the German territory. They then realized that the possibility of a surviving group of die-hard Nazis hiding in the Alpine Mountains was quite unlikely, and Berchtesgaden then changed from a strategic to a prestigious objective. Technically, the facility at Berchtesgaden was the second seat of government outside of Berlin, and since the capital was already in Soviet hands, every Western unit wanted to seize it for themselves. The location was so valuable that Major William Rossen declared, quote, By that time, the prize of Berchtesgaden was so radiant that it was obvious that considerable fame and renown would come to the unit that was first to reach Hitler's eagle nest. The Cotton Ballers Known as the Cotton Ballers, the 7th Infantry Regiment was one of the most successful American regiments during the war, fighting from North Africa to Germany and providing the Allies with victory after victory. The 7th had battled through Italy in some of the most lethal amphibious encounters during the war, but its achievements had come at the cost of being one of the regiments with higher casualties amidst the Allied forces. Thus, the members of the 7th considered seizing Berchtesgaden as an appropriate reward. It was also convenient, as the soldiers were on the move bound for Salzburg, Austria, after the capture of Munich and the liberation of the notorious Dachau concentration camp. However, there was one issue. Dwight Eisenhower had already conferred the honor of capturing Berchtesgaden to two other units, the French 2nd Armored and the American 101st Airborne Divisions. For the French, the capture of Hitler's sanctuary had a major symbolic significance, as it would serve as psychological reparation for the disgraceful defeat they had suffered in 1940. If the 101st got there first, 
it would be a fitting reward for what was now considered the most famous outfit in the army, after the devastating siege of Bastonia. Lieutenant General John W. O'Daniel, in charge of the 7th Infantry Regiment, had plainly asked for permission to seize Berchtesgaden, but he had been explicitly denied. However, as minor German offensives halted the French unit and the Americans were also delayed, O'Daniel decided that his men deserved the recognition. Thus, on the morning of May 4th, the 7th Infantry Regiment would attempt to capture the place anyway, but also actively stop the other two units from reaching the site while they explored it. The Capture of Berchtesgaden The 7th Infantry Regiment had been ordered to go to Salzburg, Austria, to defeat one of the last active Nazi units. On its way there, it had taken control of the only two remaining bridges over the Salak River. Every force attempting to reach Hitler's mountain retreat would have to go through one of those bridges. So O'Daniel orders his unit to work through the day and enable one of them to cross his unit's vehicles. Once the bridge was functional, he and most of his forces made their way to Berchtesgaden, not before telling the remaining soldiers that no one was to cross under any circumstances. After several hours of uneventful travel through an abandoned Autobahn, the 7th Infantry Regiment finally reached the prized location. The picturesque Alpine town offered no resistance to the American troops, and close to 2,000 Nazi soldiers and officers surrendered on sight. The leading Nazi commander in the town was Fritz Göring, the nephew of the Luftwaffe's supreme commander. In a typical military ritual, the young Göring surrendered his belt and gun to his American counterpart in a ceremony held in the town square. Göring also turned in all classified documents from the Nazi Air Force that his uncle had kept in his house, a great victory by itself. After the military capitulation, the 7th Infantry Regiment was free to roam the town. Still, they were ordered to limit their ransacking to not fuel Eisenhower's fury. Then, as the soldiers were exploring the city, a small number of troops made their way up to Hitler's home. The place was in ruins, as it had been bombed by the Royal Air Force back in April. Valenti, a veteran medic and son of Italian immigrants who had been a coal miner before the war, was shocked by what he saw inside Hitler's compound. Quote, we couldn't believe what we saw. The walls were covered with shelves, and the shelves were stocked with all kinds of wines, champagnes, and liqueurs. The food bins were well stocked with a variety of canned hams, cheese, and two-gallon cans containing pickles. Back in town, the soldiers that breached Goering's home stumbled into his liquor stash, which was as luxurious as the one in Hitler's home holding. Quote, 16,000 bottles of all kinds of liquor. We had Cordon Rouge, Cordon Bleu Champagne, and we had Johnny Walker's Red Label, Black Label, American whiskeys. You name it, we had it. Hermann Göring was well supplied. Many of the soldiers were in awe at the utter extravagance and unhinged indulgence that the Nazi leaders enjoyed in Berchtesgaden, especially as they had just witnessed the horrifying conditions of the Dachau concentration camp. A Diplomatic Nightmare a few hours after arriving at the town, O'Daniel was constantly scolded by a radio. As it turned out, the French 2nd Armored Division was at one of the Salak River bridges, and its commander was livid upon being prohibited from passing. After delaying the inevitable for as long as he could, O'Daniel let the French pass. At the same time, he ordered his men to leave everything as it was and prepare to depart. The soldiers then took numerous bottles of wine and fine food from Hitler's complex, while also securing as many mementos of their achievement as they could. By the time the French arrived, many riches still remained in the town and up in the mountain house. O'Daniel decided that the best diplomatic option would be to let the French claim victory and allow them to believe that they were the first to reach Hitler's home. The French forces then took possession of the Berghof and the Kelstein House, believing no one had been there before. However, a few hours later, another group of American soldiers tried to go inside the Berghof but were stopped by the French soldiers. A heated discussion ensued and things were quickly getting out of control. If it escalated further, a diplomatic nightmare would follow. The American and French commanders then agreed to take joint possession of the building and raise both the French and American flags in place of the Nazi one. Ironically, the flag that the French brought with them was too big, so the only one that ended up waving over Hitler's sanctuary would be America's. Thank you for watching our video. Do you think O'Daniel made the right decision by seizing Berchtesgaden? Let us know in the comment section below. And don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell to get more fascinating history-inspired content in your feed.